Soccer Kids Australia is now open for business. Run by experienced UK football coach James Masterman, who now calls Geelong his home, the top quality soccer coaching school is based at the Nimble Hits Indoor Sports Centre in Fernwood Avenue, Bell Park. James, who has come through the famous Leeds United and Middlesbrough Youth Academies and spent time in the US college system playing and coaching football at an elite level, offers both personal and group football tuition for soccer tots aged 3 to 5, soccer kids aged 6 to 12, as well as the highly acclaimed SK Elite program for those 12 years and over. Be nimble and be quick because spots are limited at Nimble Hits. The first session is free, so what are you waiting for? Come and try us out and who knows, you might become hooked. Soccer Kids Australia, call James on 0410-164-877. Good evening and a very warm welcome to you wherever you may be. Welcome to the Geelong Region Soccer Show. It's episode 46 and um, it's going to be a huge one tonight, an absolutely massive one. And we cannot wait to bring you this uh, show tonight. And um, a very good evening to you, Steve. St uh, my, my co-host, Steve Curtin. How are you, my friend? Good evening to you too as well, Tonchi, and to everyone who's tuning in at home. It's good to be here in the nation that is the World Cup host nation of three years' time for the FIFA World Cup. That is very exciting. Also, I must say a big hello to all of our Liverpool fans out there. Hope you've had a good weekend of celebrating. Um, that might include you as well, Tanchi, perhaps there. And hope the uh, the hangovers aren't too bad for all who've been partaking in that. And uh, also, of course, a big shout out to our, our man, Brenton Ray. The Ray man. He was on the, on the uh, football fan zone last night, enough. made an appearance, and uh, he was a very, very happy man. And uh uh, provided a couple of laughs as well for uh, for those uh, supporters that might not be too happy about what has transpired over in the old dart. But, uh, yeah, no, absolutely fantastic news. Um, yes, look, look, I've got a soft spot for Liverpool, no doubt about that, and I was very, very happy. But, you know, whether you like – it's it's like anything. You know, when, when, a, when a club has been waiting 30 long years – between titles and when they finally win it obviously emotions are always going to spill over it's and and some of the some of the uh, footage some of the um posts doing the rounds on on social media over the last few days have been nothing short of spine tingling and um you know to a to a, lo a lot of um Oh, a lot of uh, Liverpool fans all around Geelong, and there are many, many of them. Congratulations to your yeah. team for winning the EPL. Um, congratulations to our team. So uh, it was absolutely fantastic. Steve, how's your? How was this morning? How cold was it here in Geelong? Goodness me, winter! Winter has arrived. It's a it's a chilly one, actually. Yeah, it's not a good time to have your hot water service blow out. But fortunately, no, I have is that what happened to you? Yeah, but I have uh, now been able to have a hot shower before tonight's program. So hopefully that will uh, keep me awake, push through for the full hour or so of the program tonight. Uh, so that was quite satisfying. But there's been a lot of change going on in the footballing world. This weekend we've seen uh, Simon Hill has been released by Fox. Craig Foster has stepped down from uh, SBS. Now we've heard that Robbie Fowler is not coming back to uh, Brisbane Raw. So there's just a bit of change going on, but... I guess the headline is that Women's World Cup for Australia and New Zealand is the, the big piece of news that's caught the mainstream media's attention, which is really good, really good. And you hear so much um, positive thoughts about it from, from athletes from all sports when you ask any female sporting athlete or coach, whether that's um, a netball coach, an AFLW player. Certainly with the women's game, there's a lot more of a, um, a unity across all codes, it seems like. Oh, maybe except for for the AFL, uh, but anyway, um, look tonight we've got lots and lots of important guests. We're going to really, really uh, whiz through all this, and then we're going to get the news desk because we've talked about so much that's happened, and we haven't even hit the news desk yet. But uh, um, our first guest tonight, all the way from Zag Zagreb in Croatia, um, the executive manager of NK Lokomotiva Zagreb, Denis Gudasic. Um, a Geelong born and bred boy, um, he left these shores well 30 odd years ago um, um, for an adventure in Croatia and ended up staying. And now he is the executive manager of um, one of the most stable and in recent years one of the most successful clubs 
um, in Croatia, obviously behind um, uh, Big Brother, the Big Brother in Zagreb, Dinamo Zagreb, which is just recently crowned champions. But um, another international guest, or, or one that calls Geelong home now, is also going to be on tonight's show, Steve. Yeah, that's right. We're going to speak to James Masterman, and he is uh, in Australia now. He's in Geelong, and he's heading up a new uh, football academy for children. Um, and we're going to find out all about James's story, his career in football, and his uh, coaching program now for soccer kids, which is happening out at uh, Burner Avenue there in Bell Park. Now, if anyone's going to be feeling the cold, it is James because um, he's got an interesting story, this, this fella. Um, he spent 19 years in Dubai, and now he's made Geelong his base. We'll find out all about why Geelong is his base and how he's coping with all this wintry weather. And I'll tell mm -hmm. you what, it would not be not be um, very enjoyable, particularly on a cold, cold morning like today. But, uh, mate, we're going to get straight into it, straight into the news desk. Over to you. <laughs> Welcome to the news. It's Monday, the 29th of June. And now, Australia and New Zealand are officially FIFA World Cup hosts as of the announcement from FIFA in the early hours of Friday morning, Australian time. Overcoming Comnibol bitter Colombia, 22 votes to 13. The result has been joyously received by all forms of media across the nation in what has been earmarked as a landmark occasion when we hope the world best in what will be the first 32-team Women's World Cup from the 10th of July through to the 20th of August, 2023. And what will this mean for the Geelong region? Well, well keep tuning in to the Geelong Region Soccer Show to find out. Now, uh, our local A-League club from the region, Western United, has today announced the re-signing of 29-year-old central midfielder Stephen Wooster for a further 12 months, having switched from Uzbek Super League outfit, Fusikum Zarashkon. Earlier in the year, Lufthika cemented his spot in the midfield, making three starts for the Green and Blacks before the COVID-19 pandemic. Lufthika said, I'm very excited to have extended my stay at Western United. The club has already built a great culture and I'm, here, uh, and I'm happy to be part of it. With the players and coaching staff that we have, led by head coach Mark Rudan, Hopefully, we can achieve a lot of success. This follows on from the re-signing of goalkeeper Ryan Scott last week, who was a product of our family greens in the NPL prior to signing on. Now, North Geelong Warriors are delighted to welcome back Luka Jurkovic to Alco Park. Jurkovic, who has been a Warrior junior since going back to 2010, has spent recent seasons since 2017 as an integral part of the under-20s NPL one side Melbourne Knights. On his return from Summer Street, the talented 17 year old forward said, I'm incredibly happy to be back. The squad for the upcoming season is very solid. Everyone in the team and around the club has made it easy for me to fit in. I believe we will be pushing for promotion, and everyone's mentality within the dressing room is in the right place for that to happen. And the latest news coming out of Football Victoria headquarters in St Kilda Road. Is a reminder of the Nike FC Cup, which kicks off on July 26th, and it's not too late to take part. With over 85 clubs having already entered the uh, their women and girls team to the Premier Female Football Cup competition, follow the links on the Football Victoria website to register your club. And now our online poll of the week, which closes at around 8 p.m. tonight. You've still got time to vote. Does the Geelong region need more clubs to fuel further growth in the game locally? And a short time ago, those responses were, no, no, we're good, was a leading on 60% with you bet trailing on 40% after 186 votes have been cast. Tonchi. Interesting, interesting. And that is all based on last week's conversation we had with the uh, Barnes Soccer Club Strategic Planning Coordinator, um, Colin Drain made an interesting point, and he actually said we need more clubs. Um, we'll talk mm. about that a little bit more later on, um, Steve. You've still got your um, opportunity to cast your vote. We've had how many? How many votes did you say? Hundred and something. 
186. 186, almost 200. That's very good. Not too bad. And mind you, we only set the um, poll up, I think it was yesterday or the day before. So it's, it's excellent. Let's get some more votes in. And also some comments. We've had some um, three good comments. Um, um, mm. I guess you could say good comments if you're in the negative uh, side. If you're in the affirmative, you, 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 they're not good comments because there's not one comment um, supporting that 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 um, motion or supporting that suggestion. But it will be really interesting to see what people think and what people say. Be an active member of, of tonight's show. Be an active part of tonight's show. We've got two fantastic international guests and we'd like you to uh, to have your say, and we'd like you to um, to, to pop in your comments. Um, we're simulcast tonight on not only the Geelong Region Soccer Show Soccer News Facebook page, but also also on the Football Out West Facebook page. And um, it's um, welcome to everyone tuning in. Now we've got a very very special person tuning into tonight's program. I am told her name is Elizabeth Masterman. I believe she's she's James. James's mum. Did you say James or is it James's mum? I'm not too sure about English grammar there. We, we should ask James afterwards. But, um, yeah, she's tuning in all the way, all the way from the UK, and I'm sure we'll also be having quite a fair few people tuning in from Croatia as well tonight. Hopefully you'll be able to understand our very twangy Australian accent, but not to worry about that. Um, now, Steve. Any more um, exciting news happening around the traps? Uh, some good comments coming in, though, I'll say, Tonchi. Uh, news related or maybe maybe news related. Um, Christy Peel says, speaking of North Geelong, I watched some great games of juniors of North Geelong versus Geelong as friendlies on the weekend. So the kids have been at, back out on the park. So that is exciting news in itself yeah. after such a long wait. Yeah, actually, while we're talking about that, last night, Craig, Craig Filer, our, our dear colleague, who was on the um, football fan zone? He he did mention a, a little bit about that, and um, he was really impressed with um, um with actually both teams. He coaches the North Geelong under 16s, and um look look you know you, you're going to get um a lot of rusty players after such a long break, and you're going to get you know maybe mm -hmm. the match fitness isn't there. Um, but having said that, it's just great to be back. And look, yesterday the weather was just oh so fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, I tell you what, we've missed it. We have missed it so much. And um, this week the N N NPL boys juniors are due to kick kick off. The following week we've got the the um the junior uh, the local juniors, the community juniors, um, and the NPLW juniors as well. And hopefully this time next week we might even have fixtures or at least um, some form of um, an idea as to who's playing in what division, so i.e. Uh, competition mm. structures. And at the same time also we will have um, some sort of fixtures, we're hoping, this time next week. But um, definitely yeah. Football Victoria will be releasing quite a fair bit of information this week. So, uh, um, And one of the other things that, that, that is being released this week is um, – Football Federation Australia Chief Executive James Johnston has been reported in um, some of the uh, national mm -hmm. press saying that this week he's releasing a 11-point or 11-principle plan how to, to get Australian football back on the track, back on the recovery track. Mate, that, that, that will be interesting. It is. It's very exciting to see. I, I can't wait to uh, for that one to come out. So I'm not sure what day that's due out, but I can't wait to read it. And it seems 11 is the magic number at the moment, whether it's the 11, 11 dot point principle plan or the uh, the new starting 11 committee that they put together of ex, ex players of uh, Socceroos and Matildas and so forth. So that 11 seems to be the magic number. And um, hopefully James Johnson can be the magic man for football in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. Mate, anything else happening? Any other news? No, it's been a little bit of a quieter week this week. It's maybe the calm before the storm, before everything. Hope. Are you cutting out? Us? You're breaking it up. Back off again. <laughs> the reservoir. We just got our fingers crossed, and um, we know there's a lot of good work and organisation being put in by volunteers, our clubs all across um, the state and, and beyond, of course, uh, to get things going, and um, you know, at the federations to start with the fixturing and competitions and things like that. So some. Uh, Long hours being put in by a lot of people, so I just say well done to to all involved, and um, let's keep the faith that everything will resume as planned um, over the coming weeks, as has been scheduled. That would be would be really really good, really pleasing. 
Well, that's all we can do, I suppose, and that is just to keep our fingers crossed that nothing deteriorates, nothing changes. Now, you're tuning into the Geelong Region Soccer Show. It is episode 46, where we're going to take a short break, and when we do return, we're going to be talking to our first international guest, um, all the way from the Croatian capital of Zagreb, Geelong born and bred, Denis Gudasic. Don't go away. Soccer Kids Australia is now open for business. Run by experienced UK football coach James Masterman, who now calls Geelong his home, the top quality soccer coaching school is based at the Nimble Hits Indoor Sports Centre in Fern Avenue, Bell Park. James, who has come through the famous Leeds United and Middlesbrough Youth Academies and spent time in the US college system playing and coaching football at an elite level, offers both personal and group football tuition for soccer tots aged 3 to 5, soccer kids aged 6 to 12, as well as the highly acclaimed SK Elite program for those 12 years and over. Be nimble and be quick because spots are limited at Nimble Hits. The first session is free, so what are you waiting for? Come and try it out and be quick. You might become hooked. Soccer Kids Australia. Call James on 0410-164-877. Welcome back to the Geelong Region Soccer Show. It's episode 46, a very, very important episode. And I'm, I'm, I actually stand to be corrected because um, we've just said this is our first international guest. Now, I re realised way back in episode one, we actually had our first international guest back then. It was... Uh, Geelong's Laura Spiranovic, who was at the time playing in Croatia in split. Mm. So it's quite quite uh, coincidental quite mm. that our next guest now is also from uh, Croatia, but this time not from split. He's from Zagreb. And um, we welcome to the program <laughs> um, none other than, um, well, the man who um, who is uh, he's appearing on the show tonight, our guest all the way from Croatia, Dennis Gudasic. Dennis, welcome to the Geelong Region Soccer Show. How are you? Good, thanks. Good, thanks. And uh, hello to all the listeners and watchers uh, out there, people watching, watching the show this evening in Australia. Now, um, obviously, um, Australia has been built on migration. The Indigenous Aboriginal tribes first migrated to this land well over 40,000 years ago. Modern Australia was founded by the white, white settlers towards the 18th century. But then in the 1960s and 70s, we had the arrival of numerous Europeans, including one of those communities, um, the Croatian community. Steve. Um, a Croatian immigrant builder in brackets here, Filippi Holmes, uh, virtually built an entire suburb, that being St Albans Park. Even the one-time CEO of the city's most iconic employer, Ford, was the son of a Croatian immigrant. In fact, back in the 1990s, census figures revealed that Geelong was the third most, uh, that, sorry, that Croatian was the third most spoken language in the 3215 postcode. And from a football perspective, we know how much the Croatian community in Geelong has obviously contributed to the to the soccer, <laughs> namely Josip Skorko, Steve Hordvart, Matthew Sparanovic, and they'd all started their, their their football journeys at North Geelong Warriors, which is a proudly backed, supported, and financed club by the Croatian community here in Geelong. The Geelong's Croatian community hasn't stopped there. It also produced a player that went on to represent the country of his parents' birthplace in the 2006 World Cup, that being Joey Didelica, who also appeared on our show recently. Another arguably lesser known Australian Croat who has contributed rather significantly to the Australian Croatian football uh, component is our next guest. He departed Australian shores almost 30 years ago to return to the newly independent homeland of his ancestry and has never looked back. And it's Dennis, our next guest. Dennis, an absolute <coughs> pleasure to have you on the show tonight. Now, firstly, Dennis, uh, for those of the viewers who don't know you, um, tell us about your life in Geelong way back, well, almost 30 or so years ago. And um, how did you how did you arrive at the decision to, uh, to leave Australia and, and embark on an adventure that saw you never come back? Well, uh... Some of you may remember, Taunchy remembers, of course, and some of the, let's say, uh, middle-aged, older generation of uh, Croatians now, older generations, yeah, older, older members of the Croatian community. Um, I was 
pretty active in the Croatian community and uh, and when Croatia's fight for independence came up, I, I felt very passionate about it. So together with six friends, we we uh, we left Geelong and decided decided to uh, join the Croatian army uh, to help the best way we we felt we could. And uh, in in Croatia's struggle in the home and aimed war, and uh, I stayed on afterwards. Thirty years have passed. I'm I'm in I'm in Zagreb. I'm uh, happily married with uh, three children, and uh, that, that's basically it. Steve. Um, Dennis, um, so how did you end up involved in football administration at Lokomotiva? Um, and what were some of the things you had to get your head around first when you began your role there? Well, um, I had the uh, previous 10 or 15 year experience experience in various businesses in, in, in Croatia. So uh, and I was very passionate about football. I, I was approached by the club management at the time, which was 12 years ago. Yeah, 12 years ago or so. And uh, uh, the club was at the time basically evolving. You know, uh, it, the club came from fourth division in Croatia and through successive uh, relegation stints uh, or, or seasons, uh, managed to climb up to the first division. And the club was missing a little bit of organisational and, and financial knowledge. And that's where I, where I came in. I, I uh, took over uh, the position to, to help reorganise uh, you know, all the different organisational processes and the financial aspects of the running of the club. Now, it pains me to say this, Dennis, because I am a Hayduk split supporter, but Lokomotiva is indeed a stable club. And it's an old club. It's been around since 1914, but it struggles with a small profile and is often in the shadows of its much larger fellow Zagreb club, Dynamo. It's done, but it's done incredibly well. Like to, to, it's obviously got a secret. Let's call that secret, Dennis Gudasic. But um, I mean, it's home crowds numbering the hundreds, not the thousands. So, how is a small club such as Lokomotiva able to function at a professional level? But not only that, do extremely, extremely well. Um, just to explain a little bit. Um, you know, unlike un in Croatia in general, uh, we operate under a totally different operational model compared to. Uh, European counterpart counterparts, especially those in the top five uh, leagues. Um, you know, we're, we're in the developed leagues, clubs rely on commercial revenue, uh, sponsorship revenue and TV rights revenue. We have none of this in, in Croatia. So, you know, the low attendance figures relate to the entire league. It's not just a question of Lokomotiva. The only exception uh, to this is Hayduk Split, which has a, you know, very big fan base. And uh, so, so the average the average attendances in the Croatian league matches this year have been around about 4,000 uh, uh, spectators per, per match. So uh, the big four clubs, Hajduk, Dinamo, Rijeka and Osijek, uh, they, they paint a more optimistic picture, but uh, the remaining six clubs are in fact responsible for mm -hmm. the deflation of uh, league attendance figures. You know, through, the other reason is, of course, the geographical areas from where clubs derive. You know, three clubs are from population centres of more than 100,000 inhabitants, while, you know, six clubs come from uh, geographical areas with populations of, say, 20,000 or 30,000 people. So it's impossible to expect that these clubs will be attracting more than three or 4,000 people at, at, uh, at, at, at their matches. Um, the, the, the specific uh, thing that relates to Croatian football is that uh, uh, all clubs uh, demonstrate a very heavy reliance on player transfers. So in the case of, for example, Lokomotiva, 90% of our total revenue, almost 90% of our revenue comes from player and team, what we call uh, player and team performance uh, uh, revenue. And uh, this comes from player transfers, from a training compensation we receive for, foreign, for former players, that have signed with European clubs for solidarity contributions for transfers that players that our former players uh, you know might be moving on to a club in Europe um, and also a very big portion of our revenue comes from UEFA because uh, people don't realize that uh, when we see this ma uh, magical Champions League competition um, because European mo because the European model of sport is uh, has a, has a very big emphasis on solidarity mechanisms, mm -hmm. then uh, 55 national associations, uh, over 600 clubs, benefit financially from the Champions League. So the money that the Champions League earns for UEFA is distributed in significant amounts 
to help clubs such as Lokomotiva to survive. And in oh, some cases... Yeah. I was yeah. going to say, I wonder how many mm. people actually know that. Like, they probably think the TV rights, the merchandise rights, skate takings goes to all these big clubs. But so many little clubs, like Lokomotiva, like you said, are, are, are part of this footballing ecosystem in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, just to give you an example, there's some clubs in Croatia that are expecting, uh, you know, a payment from UEFA in October. This is because Dinamo participated, Dinamo Zagreb participated in the Champions League. So they, they will be receiving a payment which will make up for maybe 40% or 50% of their budget. Wow. In, in October. So that's that's the, that's the specifics of uh, club football in Europe because uh, it's, it's about a pyramid structure which places a lot of em emphasis on supporting uh, supporting all clubs at all levels, and uh, without this support, I think uh, you know the level of professionalism that European clubs have, uh, they wouldn't be able to support it. So, and in our case, um, uh, regardless of the fact that this transfer revenue, which is significant, is significant, it's very volatile because it's difficult to project for what amount and which player you're going to have, you're going to. Have, Going to be able to to be to, to sell it at a uh, during the transfer window, um, it's it's uh, it's obvious that this source of revenue has become relatively stable over the past fifteen years. So it's volatile in one sense, but then again, we've had a, we have a proven track record of being able to survive off this revenue for the last fifteen years. So it's not a strategy we choose; it's a strategy that clubs have to implement because. Uh, not having the commercial revenue that the big clubs have, we have to turn to different sources of, of revenue. Just, just to illustrate, you know, Premier League revenues uh, in England, they represent more than 10% of Croatia's BDP. So, so uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, of Croatia's, Croatia's GDP. So, so it's, a, it's a huge, yeah, it, it really shows how... Uh, how rich and how enriched some of the leagues are in Europe, and some of the some of the clubs that we have to sort of. Uh, it's, it, we're a part of this pyramid structure, and and yeah. somehow uh, UEFA has managed to make sure that some of the revenues that the big clubs uh, generate are also trickled down to the smaller clubs. So we we receive only one hundred and fifty thousand euros per year in, in in TV rights revenue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how small that is in comparison to to, to uh, other countries. It's really interesting hearing that coming from you, Dennis, because the big talking point here is the fact that um, even James Johnson, the CEO of Football Federation Australia, has says Australia needs to implement the transfer system. And also with 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 um, everything that's happened with the COVID-19 here in Australia and indeed the world, um, one of the things is that TV rights, um, $57 million was received each year from Foxtel alone for the A-League. And um, now it looks like it's going to be dropping down to what? What is it? Thirty-two million, Steve? So, uh, I think it is. Yeah. And, yeah, and yeah. everyone's pulling their hair out and wondering how the hell are we going to make ends meet? But indeed, that money doesn't often get trickled down to the grassroots clubs. But but that's really fascinating. Um, we would love to have. We would love to have such a deal in, in Croatia. <laughs> Good Lord. Actually, there was a new deal that was um, recently spruced, wasn't it? A ten-year deal. And um, has that been finalised or something like that? That's pretty... It hasn't been finalised yet. It's still a negotiation process because we're talking about some guarantees in relation to the payment because it's a new company. It hasn't dealt in TV rights so far, so, yeah. Excellent. Steve, did you have a question? Um, Dennis, fascinating to hear some of those takes on how it all works with the financial side of the off-field things over there in Croatia. Now, over there, what do you like most about your job at Lokomotiva? And what are your biggest challenges in your role? Uh, I mean, uh, in reference to what I was saying earlier, the biggest challenge is to keep the club financially stable and to operate within our means. Because uh, in football, it's very easy to chase the carrot and uh, you know try to uh, try try to earn, for example, a Champions League place by buying players, by overspending, and things like this. So it's very important. That's one of the biggest cha challenges to keep our club within a rational uh, scope so we can operate uh, uh, normally. And, uh, you know, when, when planning your finances in any business you have, um, you have fixed costs, uh, you, you have fixed costs on one hand and uh, and the, the the income is variable. So it's very difficult to project. So they're, they're some of the challenges, ch challenges that, are, that are faced for us. We have 70 people on our payroll. 
So, uh, you know, we have to make ends meet and make sure everyone gets their salaries on time. So uh, everything we do during the week or everything I do during the week, uh, going to a match on a weekend is like the icing on the cake, but it's a job like just, just like any other job in any other company. Now we've got um uh, we've got one viewer, someone you'll know very very well, Dennis Charlie Pinger. He says, "Are any ex locomotiva players playing in the big leagues in Europe?" Good question. That's that's. Oh, we, yeah. <laughs> we have many players, uh, many players playing in, in in clubs in Europe. Marcelo Brozovic at Inter uh, Milan. Uh, we have Marco Piazza at Juventus. Unfortunately, he's had some very serious injuries, not 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 recovered yet. Um, Milan Badel, Fiorentina. Uh, Kramaric scored four goals over the weekend for Hoffenheim in their match against Borussia Dortmund. So, um, in, in that in that respect, um, I think it's also important to note that even in the in the in the World Cup in the Croatian World Cup squad that played the final of the World Cup, we had uh, six players, six Lokomotiva players, or six players that spent some some part of their player development career at Lokomotiva. That's brilliant. Now, I think I read somewhere, uh, not just recently, in one of the junior setups, well, one of the junior teams in the Croatian national setup, um, might, be, might have been the under 17s or the 19s, there were more Lokomotiva players than Hajduk and Dinamo players combined. Is that is that fact? Yes, we have. Uh, we have we, our, our youth academy has really uh, developed the most, and uh, we've uh, benefited mostly from for the, our senior team has developed it. Uh, it's, uh, really taken advantage of this development and uh we seem to be producing players quite frequently at the moment yeah steve um so dennis the fact that you speak very good uh english or a native english speaker um has that certainly helped you in your role in some ways it does but uh, uh you know i i have to communicate in english only when i communicate with foreign clubs or with uefa or fifa um, everything else is in, in Croatian. Of course, it does ha it does provide me with a, you know, some advantages, um, but that's it's 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 not it's not a huge advantage versus any Croatian, if you want to call them counterparts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, apart from yourself, um, uh, uh, Dennis, there's a very strong Australian connection at Lokomotiva, or over the past decade or so, there have been many Australian Croatian players that have also enjoyed short stints at the Zagreb club. Now, some that come to mind include current soccer or not uh, recently, recent soccer, Tommy Juric, um, former Melbourne Victory, Melbourne Heart and Adelaide United player, Marte Duganjic. But it's also home to Fran Karacic, who was almost selected for the Socceroos for the 2018 World Cup. Now, how did that whole process unfold? Um, he, now, he'd never set foot in Australia, but I think his dad was born in Australia or had Australian citizenship. His grandfather. Grandfather. There you go. Tell us, how did that all come about and how was he identified? Uh, he, he was identified by the coaching staff of, uh, of, uh, of the Australian national team. Ante Milicic played an important role there because he was in Croatia. He saw Fran perform for Lokomotiva. So uh, interesting enough, like you said, Franz, Franz never set his foot on uh, Australian soil before. He's never visit, visited Australia. And uh, he, he, Franz has been with us since he was 14. So uh, he's been, he was our team captain at a very young age. And uh, he's actually moved to Dinamo Zagreb. So he'll be moving to Dinamo Zagreb in the summer. So for next season. And uh, he, Franz was putting in good performances. And uh, the coaching staff of the Australian national team noticed him and uh, they looked him up. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to actually play a short clip here from a recent game that um, uh, Lokomotiva played against Hajduk Street. Now we're back, and uh, that is insane. Now, Kylie Minogue immortalized in Croatia. Now, did you have anything to do with Kylie Minogue's song, Locomotion, being chosen as the official celebration song after every Lokomotiva goal is scored at home? That's amazing. Yeah, I had something to do with it. Uh, I, I mean, I chose the cel a celebration uh, theme song. It seemed appropriate because uh, of the name of our club. And uh, 
it was a song that sort of came came to mind. It's now grown on everybody. It's grown on the fans and the players, and we we enjoy it. Yeah, it's still there. That's brilliant. I remember seeing that. I'm thinking, did that actually happen? Am I actually hearing it? Hey, I'm a big fan of Kylie Minogue. I don't I don't mind it. What about you, Steve? <laughs> oh, he's on mute. Sorry, mate, you were on mute. Did you hear that? Oh, am I back on now? Yeah, I was just yeah, saying it's are. a great, yeah, great musical choice there for the stadium. Absolutely. Yeah, across quite well. yeah. Now, Dennis, you you have actually completed a very prestigious uh, course through the highly acclaimed UEFA Academy, the Executive Master in Global Sports Governance. Um, it sounds quite impressive as a title. Uh, what did the course involve? And can you recount your experience for us? Yeah, well, before I before enrolling in the Mesgo uh, program, it's a program which uh, which is uh, held in cycles of two years, uh, twenty three applicants or twenty three participants. It's a very demanding uh, selection process. It's designed for sports executives, uh, so people in higher positions in clubs or federations. Um, I, before before I completed the Mesgo program, I completed. Uh, uh, the UEFA certificate in football management. So this was a good leading, and uh, the Mesco uh, Executive Master in Sports Governance. It's a very demanding and dynamic program. So so we, it involves uh, sessions and, and modules in New York, Tokyo, various cities in in, in Europe. Um, it, it, it includes subjects on on the uh, context of international sport governance of sports organization legal frameworks marketing sports events future of sports governance um, basically covers all aspects of uh, managing a sports federation or a uh, or a club or, or association or whatever so the academic staff and program uh, speakers are probably the most renowned sports governance governance academics in Europe, and uh, it, it was a very enjoyable experience. I spent many sleepless nights and made many sacrifices to finish the uh, the thesis, and uh, it's given me a fantastic foundation for the job I do at uh, at Locomotiva, and it's probably one of my best life experiences and uh, just just a wonderful learning experience. Uh, I'm actually completing a. a Another course at the moment, another academic degree. It's uh, it's called the UEFA Football Law, Law Program. Due to the uh, COVID uh, situation, it's been postponed a little bit. The sessions, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, lectures. So yeah, I'm enjoying that as well. Amazing. I just, it just makes me envious that here in Australia we don't have anything remotely similar to that. And and look, you know, we are very isolated. But you know that that was that was something we talked about, Steve, right at the start of this COVID lockdown period that uh, now is the time now is the time where, where we where we should be having all sorts of um i guess uh, 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 uh online study opportunities and and it's great to see that that over in europe in croatia you're able to do some of this kind of stuff now speaking of croatia dennis croatia is truly an international footballing superpower as evidenced by the brilliant performance at the last world cup and Australian football we have seen in previous years and, as we mentioned earlier, has benefited tremendously from the Croatian connection. What can Australia, what can Australian football learn or, in fact, what should Australian football do to go forward, looking at it from, 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 your, from your Croatian perspective? Well, from a Croatian perspective, I think uh, people sometimes like to uh, generalise and say, oh, Croatia. Croatia is a specially talented nation, or Croatia, Croatians are specially talented. To a certain extent, that might be uh, true, but I think what uh, what the, the biggest reason why we, why we've been able to produce young, talented players is because we have a competition structure at a youth level, which is in fact like a filter system, like a pyramid system. And because Croatia is so geographically, because the country is geographically small, it's very easy or relatively easy for uh, coaches at different teams to locate uh, talented young players at a very early uh, age. And of course, these players uh, and young players, they move from uh, maybe a regional club to, to, a, to, to a bigger regional club and to, to a club on a national level. And uh, so I think the competition structures are very important because they put a very high emphasis on selection and reselection uh, process. So uh, players that 
kids that might join our club at the age of nine, generally speaking, unfortunately, they're not here at the age of 14 or 15 because we, 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 we're we forced to really uh, just improve the general quality of the team even at an early age. You know, we have national competition at a, uh, for 12-year-olds. So you can imagine these players on weekends, these 12-year-old kids, they, they, they travel and stay at hotels on the weekend to play their matches uh, when necessary. It's a very, yeah, professionalised youth uh, uh, system. And the other the other reason is because Croatia is forced, getting back to what I was saying uh, earlier, because Croatia is forced to sell young, talented players because it's our major source of revenue, mm -hmm. it means that young players are getting a chance to replace these sold players, these players who have been sold, at a very early uh, age and they're getting match minutes between the age of 18 and 20 and 18 and 21 at a very high professional uh, level. So, for example, uh, last year we had 534 players playing, Croatian players playing uh, for uh, professionally uh, for clubs in 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 Europe. Um, the only players that uh, were playing at the top level were players that played in the Croatian first division. Uh, and had match minutes for a period of uh, three years between the eight ages of 18 and 21. Let's mm -hmm. not forget Luka Modric, for example, he left Croatia at the age of 23. So he had he had four or five years experience in Croatia's top division before he moved to, to, to Tottenham. All the, all the other players in the Croatian national team that played at the World Cup, they all had at least three years of match minutes between the age, ages of 18 and 21. And that's where it's important, I think, that... Uh, you know, a young 19-year-old, if he's good enough, he should be playing for that, playing in, playing in a team which is in the first, first division of that particular country. Yeah, yeah. So mm. that 18 to 21 age group is critical um, for a young player to be getting as many senior minutes as possible. Exactly, exactly. And if he's not playing for, uh, you know, a professional team in the absolute top division of that particular country, I'm afraid that statistics, statistics have shown that uh, these players just don't develop as, as much as they should. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Mm. Absolutely fascinating. Steve? Yeah, definitely a problem that we have here in Australia. We could definitely put our hand up and say that we have. Um, can I just touch quickly on football infrastructure over there, Dennis? Um, hearing about hybrid pitches that are part grass, part synthetic, is this something that are popping up around Croatia? This is, uh, I, would, I, would, I would say, definitely the most major improvement in Croatia as far as the quality of football. Uh, the biggest reason for this in the last two or three years, especially in Croatia's first division, has been these, have been these hybrid pitches. It just increases the quality, uh, quality of football by at least 50%. Because when you're playing on a, on a good quality pitch, the quality of football is also uh, potentially much better. So it's an investment... Uh, that uh, the Croatian F Football Federation drew on from UEFA and FIFA development programs, and we were able, we were able to finance these hybrid pitches in all the first division, uh, at all the stadiums, the first division clubs, and it's made a huge difference. Just just quickly about local motiva setup. How many grounds? How many pitches? How many change rooms do you have? Um, and and roughly players. How many junior players uh, are under the local motiva umbrella? So we have. Um, well, first, I'll, I'll talk about the, the, our uh, training centre. The uh, uh, training centre has uh, four uh, natural turf pitches, um, an artificial turf pitch, and, of course, training facilities and our administrative administration building as part of the training centre. Plus, we play our matches in a, a stadium owned by the City Council called uh, Zagreb Stadium. And, uh, yeah, so the infrastructure is... The importance of infrastructure has proven to be very, very important uh, in Croatia. As far as our youth academy, we have uh, about 350 kids at our youth academy, 350 players. Of these 350, about 150 is what we call uh, our open youth academy. So it's it's uh, these are not players that play on a competition level in uh, in, in, a, in in these selected young teams. But, you know, we, we organise training for them so, so the kids from the age of, say, seven to the age of 10 who can participate and play football recreationally, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's similar to what we have here, mini roos, basically. And, and, and in fact, we've got a um, big shout-out to um, young Joseph Cholak, 
um, his dad, Adam, uh, they spent a couple of years in Croatia, just came back from being part of Dinamo Zagreb's, as they call it, Otvorena Škola, or open school. And, um, yeah, from what I can gather, it's very similar to what we have down here, mini ruse, small-sided, not too many games, as in no ladders and competition points. But the big difference is, whereas here, Dennis, we have maybe 14, 15 games a year, um over i'm told in in, in croatia and um craig filer was telling us in in, in um, cardiff city in wales it's something like 80 to 100 games a year uh yeah. is organized it's insane yeah so even even our eight-year-old kids so you know you have to you have to understand we have we have in croatia uh, nine thousand organized youth competition matches every weekend uh you know more than sixty thousand players are playing competitive league football uh, the emphasis being on competitive, on the on the kids, yeah, sort of having this, uh, you know, this 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 desire to win the league, to win the competition. I think it's very important. Although the trend is in some countries, I hear that uh, that that the emphasis is not so much on uh, on winning or or competing, but more so on participation. Um, so so the, these the, these players, they they uh, they participate in regional tournaments in regional competitions and that's where we select players for the best players for our youth academies um for example even in zagreb uh we have 5500 kids every weekend from the age of 7 to 12 they're competing in 180 matches just in zagreb every weekend so you can imagine the, the number of kids and the level of competition that these uh you know that these matches produce for kids Amazing. Now we've got a couple of questions from uh, from some viewers. Maxi Santich from Melbourne says, "At what at what age is this talent discovery generally happen, and what attributes do they look for?" Well, how many attributes? I mean, uh, I, I don't think there's a particular age because some players, some young kids, are mature at, a, at an older age. Some kids at a younger age. Um, Generally, all the all the aspects that relate to senior football, they also apply to, to, to young kids as well. You know, I mean, there's no 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 big difference. That you know, uh, just basically uh, match perception, the player's ability to 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 function in a, in a in a team to see what other you know a particularly talented player. He probably has skills that uh, his teammates doesn't do do not necessarily have. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the coach's job is to look at all the different elements of of of, of, a, of, a, of a young player and uh, decide whether or not he can fit in with the team. Steve, very good. Um, young players over there as well, Dennis. Are they dabbling in other sports to keep themselves occupied in when they're not playing football? Or um, are they it's very pretty, pretty common for for uh, for, for uh, kids at the age of nine, ten, or eleven. It's proven that this is good, also. They um, they also do judo, martial arts, uh, just generally good for agility, um, swimming, uh, even wrestling. So um, it's it's something we support. So if a kid at our academy at twelve years old wants to do some other sports, generally generally speaking, uh, the, the, all these sports prove uh, beneficial for them. There you go. Interesting. And remembering Croatia is a country of just over 4 million people. You could quite easily fit the population within um, the boundaries of Melbourne, I suppose. But uh, it's just an incredible insight into, into a, a country that is just football mad. But it, more importantly, has got its house in order as far as development is concerned. Now, we've got a big shout out to um, Susie Gudasic, who I believe is your sister-in-law. Bravo, Dennis Gudasic, she says, quite simply and quickly. And um, speaking of, of siblings, my brother, Rado Prusat, says, when is Lokomotiva in North Geelong going to set up sister club relations to have player exchange trials, etc.? Maybe wishful thinking on our behalf where we look at some of the professionalism that is going on there. It's uh, just mind-boggling. It really, really is. Um, speaking of family, Dennis, any last words for your legion of family and friends that might be tuning into this podcast and to the general football public of Geelong, your old hometown? Yeah, well, just a big hello to all my family and uh, all my old friends back in Geelong. Um, those that remember me after 30 years since since I, since I left, uh, especially big hello to everyone at the Croatian Community Centre in Geelong. This is where I grew up and spent most of my time as uh, a young uh, Australian Croatian before I left for Croatia. So, yeah, just generally big hello to all the listeners, all the people watching the show and uh, everyone else. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dennis.
Thank you. That was uh, Dennis Gudasic all the way from Zagreb, um, Croatia. And um, Steve, a really interesting insight into a country that is doing so, so well um, internationally. And, um, and you know, it, it's it's four, what was it? Four natural turf training pitches, one artificial pitch, plus your administrative and training centre. And um, amazing, just, in, just absolutely in, insane, isn't it? It is, it is. It's. Um, I had the privilege of going over there and watching a Lokomotiva game one time, actually, which was against Dinamo, which was good. And again, like as, like you said, I was surprised by that there wasn't more people at the game. But now we understand more about how it all works and um, how the money is trickled down through not only the transfer system, but also through that system through UEFA's distribution of funds based on um, performances of clubs in Champions Leagues and so forth. So... It's uh, fascinating, very, very different to how, how I was finding it, but also hitting the nail on the head there with the minutes for players at senior football aged 18 to 21, which we do not get enough of in Australia. Uh, that's that's so, so true. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's something that needs to be changed here. And, look, at the end of the day, if, um, if, 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 if a player is not going to get any um, um, minutes at, at that elite level, they need to drop down into a second division. We need that second. There's so many things, and this is the pro this, the problem why here in Australia the, the system is so broke as far as our football is concerned. There's so many things that need to fixing. There's a transfer fee system needs fixing. I mean, can you imagine last week we had Bowen? Imagine a Bowen player all of a sudden goes off to a, um, a Western United or goes off to, a, I don't know, an NPL club and then he jumps up to an A-League club. And there is that ongoing some transfer um, percentage or whatever, you know, a 10% of a future transfer. You know, if, if he was to go off for $3 million, 10% of $3 million would be what, $300,000? dollars Imagine a I've got calculator here. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I don't need a calculator, thankfully. And um, <laughs> imagine that just hypothetically speaking, then a bar and soccer club was to get $300,000 from a player, you know, uh, I don't know, Milton Bailey or a, or a I'm not sure who, whoever else. Amazing. Mm. The mind boggles. And that is the beauty of the transfer system. And that is also the beauty of a second tier competition, allowing more young players an opportunity. And then clubs like Rangers, Geelong, North Geelong, um, Bell Park, Bell uh, Surf Coast, they're going to put money into their infrastructure in order to try and get these players sold off in the hope of maybe landing that little nugget. But amazing, amazing. Steve, what's coming up next? Yeah. A lot of opportunities there when you start to think about it. Well, coming up next, we've got our next guest. He's been waiting in the green room. His name is James Masterman from Soccer Kids. Um, so he's going to be telling us all about his life and times in football, which includes UK Academies, US College System, 19 years in Dubai. So don't go anywhere. It's going to be a fascinating chat with James Masterman coming right up after the break. Soccer Kids Australia is now open for business. Run by experienced UK football coach James Masterman, who now calls Geelong his home, the top quality soccer coaching school is based at the Nimble Hits Indoor Sports Centre in Fern Avenue, Bell Park. James, who has come through the famous Leeds United and Middlesbrough Youth Academies and spent time in the US college system playing and coaching football at an elite level, offers both personal and group football tuition for soccer tots aged 3 to 5, soccer kids aged 6 to 12, as well as the highly acclaimed SK Elite program for those 12 years and over. Be nimble and be quick because spots are limited at Nimble Hits. The first session is free, so what are you waiting for? Come and try us out and pay the link program for those 12 years. Soccer Kids Australia. Call James on 0410-164-877. Welcome back to the uh, Geelong Region Soccer Show. It's an absolute pleasure to uh, bring our next guest on, on the screen here tonight. And um, it's none other than James Masterman. James, a very warm welcome to you, and thank you for joining us here on the Geelong Region Soccer Show. Thanks, Tonchi. Appreciate that. Hey, Steve. 
Thanks, James. Thanks for getting on board tonight. Yeah, Nori says, uh, Dennis, yeah, listening to him and the conversations are pretty insightful. But uh, yeah, well, going back playing experience yeah. as well, I can give you information about how the FA Cup filters down into the lower divisions as well, which really does support. All well, let's that. go right back to the start. Yeah. Tell us the James Masterman story way, way, way back when you were literally, literally uh, playing. Now, was it in yeah. Middlesbrough? Was it Middlesbrough that you started? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Middlesbrough youth system um, from the age of nine, ten years old, all the way up to uh, 16. Uh, I was in the youth setup there. Uh, again, playing regular football every week, training twice, three times a week. My mom, who's, who's listening to the show now, she, you know, she, was, uh, she, she drove me everywhere. Uh, they all called her Lizzie Flask because she stood at the sideline with the cups of coffee in Bovril, watching all the guys play. And, yeah, so just just playing there and traveling and touring and playing different competitions and getting picked up by Middlesbrough and then going on and playing in different tournaments and, you know, some international tournaments, um, some local ones and just playing against all different professional setups as well. So uh, actually touch base with one of the guys I played against. He's a Perth Glory technical director. Um, and he, he played against me when I was 13, 14 years old when he was at Celtic. So we just reconnected when I've just come over. So, yeah, so there's life after after playing football as well. I guess talking to um, Dennis just then, and, and yeah. he was telling us about the um, the juniors, the juniors, how the junior system is is um, set up in Croatia. And look, eight, eight-year-olds playing an astounding amount of games each year. Was that what it was like in England growing yeah. up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, there was overuse injuries, which was a major, major problem at the time where we were playing competitive football, 70, 75, 80 games a season, purely because from the professional setup and the school setup, it wasn't really governed. So you would have to represent your school teams, which played and trained, and then you played for the professional teams on weekends. Um, then sort of later in life, they got together, said, look, without burnout injuries we, we have to come to some sort of arrangement here where if they're selected for the teams of the counties then you theoretically aren't going to be playing for the school teams so then they try to monitor all the uh, overuse injuries too many games but yeah the on a regular basis up to i think 12 13 years old i was playing 70 75 games a year um from going from well playing saturday mornings then go and play Sundays compared to the football for the Sunday league team, then training during the week and playing for the school and weekend, uh, sorry, Wednesdays. Okay. Yeah. So, so in hindsight, was it too much, do you reckon? Um, yeah, in, you moder in moderation, yeah. yes, because as a child, you don't know. You mm -hmm. don't. You just want to play and you yeah. don't realise how much it does does affect you later in life. Because at the moment, you know, kids just want to play and they just they will play three, four, five times a week. Really, really strong physical but then later in life, we're at 13, 14, you've got guys who are really at the peak and then start fading off. Injuries here, the growing pains, um, the knees are really short, the hips are going because displacement through not playing on the right ground, wearing the right shoes and too mm. much. Then when they get to 21, you, you're looking at these guys who are phenomenal footballers. Then where are they? they, they they've retired through injury because they've played so much. It takes 10 years from training and to become a professional as such. But then how much football do you play between that time is, is key. And that's when the professional system started twisting to monitoring how much you're being coached, what sort of technical drills you're doing and how much football you play in the weekends and, 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 and who you're playing and what competitions they're entering and so forth. But going back, well, unfortunately now going back 25, 30 years, we didn't know any of that. Now it's all evolved. Uh, and that's why all the technical directors are involved now with all the clubs monitoring how much training they're having, where they should be playing, who they should be playing against. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's evolved a, a, a lot. So, James, you finished up at Middlesbrough and then tell us about the next chapter after that. Yeah, so so basically um, Middlesbrough, sort of 16 years old, lots of the guys at the time we all went on trials in that three or four week crazy period where, where you don't get selected or you don't get signed up for any any clubs. So the teams that you represent go, there you go, we've arranged five or six 
uh, clubs for you to go to. Uh, two weeks here, one week there, a few games. So I went to Preston, Doncaster, Cambridge. I went up to Sunderland. Um, yeah, we, so somewhere, uh, two weeks, somewhere, uh, a couple of games just in that week. Um, and it's all crazy because you've got guys that are coming from all over the parts of the country to fill these spots up for the next two or three years. And clubs look at you for 25 minutes to an hour or ask you to go back for three more sessions. And and that's being a 16 year old, your life is on 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 that game. Uh, there's lots of pressure. Uh, if it's not to be, you go to the next club, not to be. Look, it wasn't meant to be for me um, with my 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 family behind me, you know, with the education side. They said, look, life's not over. Go and get your education, you know, go back into the football scene with your sport and exercise degree. Um, I was lucky enough to go to college, go to university, part of it. I went to America. I played and coached over there. Um, got a good sort of education and, yeah, um, life's oyster when you, uh, when you get your education because everything opens up. You, you, you're getting phone calls for all the guys that have been in the professional setup asking you advice, what coaching qualifications, what you need to do because now – their careers are sort of theoretically over wanting to, to pursue. And it's, it's, it's quite sort of uh, quite nice to catch up and reminisce and if some buts, but it, look, it's, it's football at the end of the day, you know, uh, go on. Now, James, um, this morning was a very, very cold oh. morning. I think it was like zero degrees. Now, uh, Ponty, please tell me about it. Now, normally, if, if you're in the um, in the middle, the, 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 what are they call Middlesbrough? Is that the Midlands or something like no, that? No, no, no. Uh, well, uh, Middlesbrough, it's near Newcastle. It's uh, okay. on the north. Yeah, it's on the northeast. You'd be, we, you'd, you'd be accustomed to cold oh. temperatures. But, yeah, but I've been outside the country for 20 years, living in, uh, living in Dubai, going from one extreme to the other. So... In, in Middlesbrough, you, you you would have 50 weeks of the year rain and cloud and miserable and two weeks of the year beautiful sunshine. So I went opposite. I went to 52 weeks of the year glorious sunshine and <laughs> very rare rain. So I got, and then coming here, I woke up this morning, it's two degrees. It was cold. I couldn't move. My fingers all went numb. Yeah, so I, I had to ring my uh, my wife to go to Bunnings and get some heaters for, uh, for the sports camp I did this morning. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But tell us about Dubai. You spent almost 19 years. Yeah. There, and yeah. it is a different world. Like I remember when we caught up um recently, you were telling me, and I, I was my mouth was just my jaw was dropping. It's just yeah. a different world. It is an absolutely different yeah. world. Yeah. Well, 19 years ago to, to compare to now, there's like uh, you know, every every six months it changes. So from 19 years ago to now, you know, the you couldn't even own property um there, there was maybe 200 places that you could go for something to eat in restaurants or, or go for a drink you know if you went to every single bar or hotel and place it would take you seven years to go and see every single thing at the time you know you'd you see everything within a year because you go to a different place and yeah there, there's so many communities so many uh nationalities live in there as well it's just an a, a unbelievable hub and harmonious how everybody can actually work and and co coexist with each other because at the end of the day outside of that bubble yeah there's this conflict but living there it's a it's it's very unique you're there for a reason you're there to work and you're there to sort of mix and 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 sort of you know be courteous with your neighbor because your neighbor at the end of the day yeah it, it, it's one of those ones but 19 years ago it, it, it's it's like an amuni oasis it's all sand and uh, you had little pots of of grass here and there, and these extraordinary buildings going up 25 stories. But now you've got 180 th 180 story building up, and there's another one planned at the next end of the year. And you know, this world state, a brand new stadiums being built. It, you've got its first one outside of UEFA. Obviously, you've got UEFA, which is in Europe, and then you've got the Middle East, which is uh, you know the football federation, and obviously over here. But outside, they've got the first UEFA approved rehabilitation center. And you've got all the pros coming on holiday for warm weather training. And they set up this uh, facility where, well, last year there's Pogba, Rashford, name, name some, you know, drop names there. But they were there doing rehabilitation, uh, some bathing during the day, but, you know, trying to get trying to get fit. But going back 19 years ago, there was just myself and another guy doing some uh, some football coaching there. And it just started boom. Everybody started moving over. There was children going to school, and because we're all expat, you know, the affiliation didn't really cater for expat children there. 
you know, there's the locals were 25,000. There was 2 million expats. They were living in, in Dubai in the Middle East. So, you know, we outnumbered, but there was nothing really catered there. So I sort of sat down and worked out, did a bit of research, what was there and look at the end of the day, the, the children needed to do some extracurricular activity. So I linked up with a school, worked with the PE side and helped coach their school teams. And off, offshoot of that, the, the children who weren't involved in the teams wanted training. But if you didn't organize anything, they weren't being trained. So I spoke to them, hired the facility, and yeah, Soccer Kids uh, Dubai sort of set up from there. there you Two go. guys came involved, and my business partner, Ben, who's listening in from Dubai as well. You know, we, we, we came up with the idea to to go to various venues, go to various locations, and not just in Dubai, Fijira, Raj Al Khaima. And children were there just, just wanting to do it. And football was one aspect. And from the offshoot of this, you had basketball kids, you had tennis kids. You know, there's other sports that came off from it because kids wanted to do it. Um, not so much organised games and weekends because it's still very, very infant. There was, wasn't enough teams to play organised games, but there is now. But at the time, there wasn't. It was just, do you want to play football? Cool. Go down here and do it and internal leagues and adult leagues and stuff. But yeah, that the, the biggest development is, is how good the children are. Um, I've teaching some kids that now have moved back to uh, to New Zealand. They're playing for New Zealand Olympic squad on the 23s and the 21s. Dual mm -hmm. nationality. One of the brothers is playing for Iraq national team. Got one boy who signed up for Munchen Gabak in, uh, in Germany. Uh, some trials going backwards and forwards to English clubs, but because of, of limited leagues, pro clubs aren't really looking because they're not developed far enough you know, for them to sort of take knowledge but th there are there are some really talented once they go back to the national home countries then yeah they, they, they can get picked up but yeah there's well now as i said weekends there's lots of competitions all the teams all the clubs are getting together and playing and really exceptional football touring parties going back to to, to europe so yeah um, James, what first got you over to um, to Dubai, and and also when you were there, how how did you combat the uh, the heat with the um, playing a cardio sport like football? Yeah, um, <laughs> well, it was sort of uh, my dad was working over there at the time, and he was sort of re, re uh, well seconded back over there for seven weeks. But anyway, that lasted seven years. But I moved over to be with him, finished university, finished getting all my education, and I, I just on holidays, just seeing the opportunity to do something there. And I thought, you know what? I think this is the next, my, my next call is, is to go there as a, as a 21 year old, you know, coming out of football background and seeing America coaching there and seeing what's happening. Dubai was just, just the place, just a boom. And, and I wanted to be part of it. So I went there, um, combating the weather, uh, go inside. We we have state of the art sports facilities, uh, a bit like Canada. When when it's winter time, everybody goes underground. They have plus forty to minus forty. When Dubai, you know, you're going from winter time, which, which has has snowed in the mountains. Not not many people know that, but has. But uh, going from five or six degrees at night during the winter time to summer time, um, yeah, fifty odd. It's uh, quite. You go out, your eyes burn. Your chest burns, your lungs burn. You change your clothes three or four times because everything is sweaty. You go outside, you take your glasses off because they're all steamed up because of the heat from AC to going outside. <laughs> but uh, when, when I first started, it was why I linked in with schools because schools have uh, sports halls. So you use that outside facility and then when it's too hot or when it rains, which is very rare, the flood, ground gets flooded, you move everybody inside. Um, so we, we did that and that's that's how the sports comes but the season there is September through to uh, June and obviously yep. the summertime is June through to uh, September so that's the hottest part so usually the schools stop there uh, yep. but we, we do all our summer camps we're talking with Soccer Kids Australia internationally accredited coach um, and founder, obviously, um, James Masterman. James, who is now, after 19 years in Dubai, a stint in the um, US college uh, system, started off in native UK, playing for Middlesbrough and Leeds United um, Academies, now find yourself here in Geelong. And how did you get to our beautiful neck of the world? 
beautiful um uh, the geelong is heaven on earth um not for the weather but for, for the people and everything else how did you get yeah. to be here and base yourself and tell us about your new business venture yeah uh romance would basically find me in geelong yeah romance no uh, my wife is uh is a geelong native coincidence she had a very similar story to me she left 20 years ago uh worked with emirates um found herself in dubai and uh 14 years ago we hooked up and uh you know it's all blossomed we got married uh we have a, a lovely uh three and a half year old daughter liliana and it was just at the time you know um sending my daughter to school we just needed normality and reality for for children for her um to play with children and you know at the same time, um, it, it's a private sort of school education. Uh, being self-employed, you know, everything there is isn't free. You know, it's government for not government funded. You have to pay for it, and I couldn't justify. And I thought, with Liliana and Emma wanting to come back here, it was just the right time. Uh, that was a year and a half ago. Um, there's some good things happened out of COVID, um, and one of it is me coming over here, spending time and uh launching uh, soccer kids australia um one of the reasons geelong is family um and also, and also potential as well sorry mate i was just going to yeah. say just put a photo of uh lily yeah i saw yeah that's that's my daughter yeah kicking a ball about but but potential the thing is that with geelong it's it's untapped it, you know is with soccer itself if you if you melbourne you know i've done, done some research if you melbourne you will joy to there you know you've got this you've got that you got that you can go to whatever you can have this facility if you're you're progressing to a certain level state football or you want to excel they're all in they're all there but geelong with the amount of development happening with armstrong and going down to leopold and so forth you know just listening to the news it's two hundred fifty thousand people living in geelong in the next 10 years it's 1.2 million but looking at sports facilities that are open and how many teams that are, uh, are playing football on weekends but again they all have to travel if you're sort of certain level you, you go and travel state games and, and and that side but if you if you picked up to a certain level you you have to go to melbourne you, you know there's not a lot of progression but there is in your own clubs you know you go from one team to the next team and you know the the, the coaching's improving but you know at the end of the day, you have to go to Melbourne if you want to progress. Uh, I've seen Western United, obviously, they're uh, setting up and playing some games, getting the exposure for the kids in Geelong area. But again, before that, you know, there was Victory and City that were playing. So kids from here had to travel an hour and a bit to go and watch them and, and coming back. But yeah, not many parents will want to do that on a regular basis for competitive football. So if there's something in Geelong, which which there is, there's, there's great leagues. I went to watch the uh, uh, North Geelong girls play under 16s against each other. It's phenomenal, you know, good girls football, good standard. But if you want to progress again, where? Well, what I'm, angle and stuff, you know? Yeah, on the screen, we've got a couple of flyers there for, for yeah. anyone that may be interested in Soccer Kids Australia, now coaching at Nimble Indoor Sports. And some, some, in fact, most people will know Nimble hits indoor sports as the old action indoor Yes, sports. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. Three coaching starts 15th of July, which is uh, in a couple of weeks' time. And there's your number, James, 010 yeah. 164 And then on the right yeah. side, we've got um, 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 there's three different categories. So the soccer tots, soccer yeah. kids, and soccer elite. Tell us a bit more about those different programs that you yeah, offer. So, yeah, so the uh, the soccer tots program, three to five, um, you know, basically it's nursery school theatre, you know, it's uh, going into and exposing the kids to different techniques, you know, motor coordination, spatial awareness, and making it fun. Because at the end of the day, you know, if the children aren't enjoying it, they're not going to learn. So we make 30 minute, 45 minute programs and all children related. Um, you know, we, we, we link in with the schools and find out what topic they're learning that week. So the, the children could be certain animals or certain cars or certain like that. But it, it, it's football based so everybody has a ball everybody's moving it's not too much stop start but to explain the games you have to but it, it's color based so you know we shout different colors they run to that the different skills touching but different body parts in the ball so that's the the, the basic side um and then 
you know, it's a nice little feeder to the next section where it's after school programs or in school and, and helping the PE guys do their soccer teams um, from five years to eight years called soccer, uh, soccer kids program. And again, we, we can do that basic program or we can do a slightly more advanced, but we, we tailor make it in with the, uh, with sort of the ability of the groups and, and, and what the school wants. Um, obviously, linking in with Nimble Hits used to be Action Sports. Mm. Um, they basically said, look, we, we need someone to come involved and, and take the soccer coaching that they had to the next level. Um, but, you know, can't be more more specific. So we're doing the beginner, intermediate, advance. Um, obviously, you see sort of there, it's an SK Elite program. You know, if you're 14, 15, 16, or well, from 12, you don't want to be called kids anymore. So we, we came yeah. up with a funky idea, cool lo logo of calling the SK Elite program. Um, but with it, within that, um, uh, again, there's some 13, 14 year olds who not played football. Uh, and I was asking, done some research the other day, just, are you wanting to play? Yes, yeah, but you know, it's the confidence, it's the self sort of, I'm not good enough, I can't go and join a team. Um, and sort of seeing the, the disparity sometimes, well, Open, well, clubs are open, they're wanting everybody to come and play, but these guys who, who are basic, who, who don't have sort of the skills to play in that level, there isn't like the feeder down, but there is, there is the younger ones, but certain, at a certain age, if you're new to it because you've been playing AFL or you've been playing uh, racket sports and you're wanting to socialise, because at the end of the day, there's, there's lots of children just wanting to do it for fun. So there's a niche in the market just for the training side, Obviously, we get sl slightly more competitive with the abilities increasing that wanting to do it, but, you know, can't join the competitive because they haven't got the basics. But yeah. you know, it's, a, it's a catch-22. So and, that's and, side, and, and it could sort of link in with the other clubs that yeah. when they come to me, they, they go, well, we want to play. I'll go, okay, North Geelong, there's a guy down there, Simon. It's, look, go here, or you go to sort of Dale at uh, Barwon, uh, that these guys can come and play, but at the same time, vice versa so, so like that so sort of finding a niche in the market that there it's just the link from playing at school to the to the the next level of, of playing competitive football at the end uh, on a saturday so yeah. we, th that's we where i fit in we mentioned something earlier in our chat with dennis um how yeah. how, how short our season is you know um the yeah. mid through season here is 14 15 games and look, what for you know? I, I coach a, 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 a mini ruse team, and this year we're, we're moving from under nines to under elevens, and we've got a couple of kids that are playing football for the first time. And when they're coming up against kids that are sometimes two, three years younger than them, but have been playing since they've been yeah. five, it's 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 awful for the for the kids that have been playing because they feel like they're being kind of held back. But at the same yeah. time, for those kids that are just coming in at the deep end, it's really awkward because they're a little bit older, but they're sort of a little bit, you know, when it comes to football terms, a bit uncoordinated. Yeah. So bridging bridging program like this, I think, is a, is a brilliant idea. Yeah. Um, I think would be fantastic. And the other thing is when kids stop playing winter sports, for example, Auskick or AFL or basketball, um, I know in years gone by, I've had parents come up to me and say, oh, when do they play soccer? Can they play soccer in the summer, in the off-season? Yes. And unfortunately, at the moment, the conventional kind of, um, way it's being held, it's it's not catering for yeah. for, for people. So a program like this, I, I think, is 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 a is a great uh, void filler, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Well, we um we 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 tell them the program's going with term time, so you know it's ten week programs, and then if they want to try another sport, it's, they can try. But you know, so we keep we're not going to commit to saying there's forty weeks a year that you have to come and do it. It's rolling with it because children want to try other sports, but at the same time. There's you've got the pre-season and off-season, then you've got a very short window in between for competitive. But outside of that, plus we, it's an indoor one, so we're not with the elements where it's not going to be too hot inside or it's not going to be you know raining. So we can carry on all year round. Um, obviously, we, we've got adult bookings that we can do there for five-a-side football. But you know, with, with with the COVID hitting, it's reduced the the game time. But bear in mind from Dubai as well, this school's football season was only eight weeks long. So if you wanted to play competitive football for us, that's sort of where all the football companies came together and we create our own league where yeah. that goes for 24 weeks a year. So you've got there again, you've got 24 weeks of actual competitive football. 
But again, for those children to progress, they need to play football, but you're in a catch-22. To play too much, you're not going to progress how you're supposed to go and, uh, you know, having the children in ability levels and so forth. So training in school is a great idea. And then after school and doing it here as well with with the restrictions with COVID and, and just starting sort of, I think it's next week, you know, well, yeah. two weeks ago was competitive training for the youngsters. You have to do it because these are the years that, if children are limited to, to, to training now, these are the development years. If you're at a certain level and you want to progress, you have to be training, you have to be doing this. Because you've missed 110 days, I think, you know, three months. You know, you need to get your touch, you need to get your, your ball work, you need to be able to play with your mates and work as a team. And now you're starting fresh in the season. See how many injuries have happened with the pros back in Europe, back there. Because they've had so long off that they haven't had the competitive sort of football with the youngsters now it's exactly the same when they come back it takes three or four weeks for them to actually get yeah the the you know the in the game you touch in the game and all sorts yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the fitness as well you don't realize 10 days your fitness starts going if you don't do anything for 10 days it's, it's okay but after 10 days it starts but then with the youngsters, you have to do it for the mental reasons, for the socializing reasons, just to get them out and, and a bit of clarity for the parents, you know, for you to relax because they're going to run. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, um, Steve, a question for you, actually. This is a question for the host, so I'm going to pose this question to you. Ben McBride. Ben McBride says, would the hosts agree that there is a lack of or lack of coaching for younger children? What do you think, mate? Uh, I mean, unlike you, Tonchi, I'm not a parent, so I might not be the best person to give a response on this, but it does seem like a lot of the coaching academies that exist are aimed more at the teenage years rather than the maybe under, under 10, 9, 8, 9, 10, 11 sort of age range. Would you agree? Look, I, I, I'd sort of agree with Ben in a sense. I think there is a lack of quality coaching. I think, um, you know... At, Depends on what level it is. You get a lot of mums and dads, well-meaning mums and dads coming along, coaching, uh, yeah. you know, depending on, on the club as well. You might get, you know, kids that in the mini ruse, yeah. And, and I guess from a front end, it's all about them having fun and enjoyment and really falling in love with the game. But but um, I, I guess, James, you'll probably agree on this, and I, or, or maybe not. I'd like, to, um, I'd like your take on this. At the back end, from a coach's point of view, you're always having to try and work on how to best develop these kids for the next level. Yeah, You know, those kids that are ready to step up, you're going to encourage them to go down that path. The kids that maybe are not yet ready to step up, they need some quality type coaching um, that maybe at the moment they're not getting, really. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the thing is, I don't want to step on any, any coach's toes or anything like that, but Melbourne-wise... If you live in there, you've got obviously the the, the pro clubs there, City and, and Victory, that there is, you know, the pre-academy and obviously the, the looking coming to the Geelong, Geelong area. But sort of around that area, there is that progression pre-academy. Obviously, you've got the youngsters from eight, nine that they're tapping into because obviously the progression upwards. But they have that in Geelong, the, Melbourne Victory, and it's very. It's only in the last year that it's happened. Yeah, I, I was just about to say, now that they're looking now into... Uh, the Geelong area that the, there is, but it, it's certain days or times parents committing to, you know, it's the commitment from the parents. Children want to do it, and there are talented footballers out there, youngster wise. But again, it's how do the clubs that they're playing with now benefit from that? Because you're saying about a pre contract, maybe selling on future. You know, when I, when I grew up, playing that there were sort of contracts i signed for middlesbrough when i was 10 years old that meant i couldn't play for any other club okay then if i did make it a percentage would go to my my club the guy who signed me on he would get a percentage and so forth um in dubai it's illegal you can't do that but do with think? the pro with the pro clubs if they do sell players the club actually owns the players and rent them and come back there's a transfer sort of scenario there but here if you're playing for, say, I'm just going to say not Geelong, and they go and train with Melbourne Victory, again, you've, you've got children, like, am I playing here, am I playing there, what's my progression? Now, am I going to go, you know, the next level, the next two or three or four years, will I play for Victory? Then that really doesn't benefit North Geelong because you've just lost one of your best players. But saying that, it'll benefit you because 
the guys seeing these boys playing and girls playing will attract because you then become a feeder into the professional system. Mm. But then going in, if he then gets sold later, because everybody wants to be a pro football and sometimes the money's in Europe, you're getting sold and going into Europe, North Melbourne won't, sorry, North Geelong won't get the the benefit from it, only Melbourne victory because of that sort of filter system. Um, and you touched on it with Dennis with Croatian clubs and over here, something needs to sort of work out to help the amateur clubs. Yep. Okay. Improve the coaching because then the clubs, you know, so as in Bowen the, the other day are doing the strategic program with player development, coaching development, uh, and, and seeing that if this is all implemented to all the clubs, the level of coaching increases, the performance level of the children increases, which then benefits the pro clubs because those children then go and play for the victories, Western United uh, and the cities. Um, and then again, you can sort of have a funnel down that you then put money back into this club system, which then benefits everybody. Because at the end of the day, children want to progress, but if they can't see the next level, they're not going to go and train with these clubs. They're only going to stay in their little hub, in their little communities, because the dad played, the, the brothers played, you know, so-and-so played. So it's like family orientation that way. Um, but it just needs to be transparency between. But uh, the scope to do it, if they improve the coaching, then you know, going to Melbourne Victory for these pre academies where kids want to, but, but at the same time, the children have to play football, and they'll only look at children who want to play, and yeah. then clubs again will only look at children who can play. So this is where I come in: is the bridge. I train children for the fun. And, and enjoyment and, and developing that side and social side. But then at the same time, the, the better footballers can progress because I, I can go to, you know, Tonchi, these guys need to come here or Dale, they need to go here or however. Oh, don't send but, it to Dale. Don't send it to Dale. Dale leaves kids. <laughs> yeah, but, but no, but what, what I'm saying is, you know, there's, 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 other, there's, there's lots of clubs, Karaya Club, you know, you've got you know, Geelong, you've got, you know, um, Lara just setting up, you know, so you've got, Loads of clubs, Armstrong United as well. So, Thank you, you know, it's good to see that we have got a lot of clubs. And actually, that was yeah. one of the questions in our poll during the week. Um, James, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. But before we do, um, tell us what are the programs that you're offering, um, especially now over the school yeah. days, and how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, so we're, we're offering a multi sport camp uh, where we do football, basketball, hockey, tennis, dodgeball. We're doing some Nerf games. Um, it's inside uh, at uh, Nimble Hit Sports Stadium of uh, Fern Avenue. Um, everything's on the website, and you, you're doing the, uh, um, the the push for it. Oh, he just left us. Oh, hello. Oh. We have lost James. We've lost him right at the. Time. We have lost him. Unfortunately, yeah, we've lost James. Hopefully, he'll be back. Uh, look, that number is 0410 if you are interested in um, finding out anything about um, uh, the programs that James does offer. Um, look, he, he seems like a very, very well, well credentialed, very well accredited coach. Um, it, it's a, we will have to get him on one day again because he had some very interesting points there. Yeah, mate, time is getting past us, um, 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 Steve. Now, have we got the um, results of that poll? It Whoa. Yeah, it's full time in the poll. And we've got in the question debating whether Geelong would require further clubs in the region to fuel growth in the game locally. The winner on 60% is uh, no, no, we're good, ahead of uh, you bet with 40%. So... Uh, opinions there and um, just there, yeah, a fraction more people out of the 187 are uh, perhaps more enthusiastic about investment going into the existing clubs across the region. Tonchi, some good con uh, comments as well coming in from uh, Steve Kohler, uh, Ahmed Idris, and uh, Stephen Lavelle, all making some good points. A lot of it comes back to uh, infrastructure facilities, volunteers, and, and uh, certainly. Um, Volunteers, we do our best with volunteers. Infrastructure is um, something that can be beyond our control sometimes. But for me, I think this question comes back to what we were chatting about with 
Colin Drain last weekend, like with Barwon in that southern region being at capacity a lot of the time in most of their uh, age groups and things and their scope for running training sessions, that southern region is really lacking um, in those existing established southern suburbs. The only other club in that area really is uh, Deacon Ducks and they are not a junior club. So um, I get look it. at that area, Highton, Belmont, yeah. Dale, Warren Ponds, Marshall, like not, no other clubs for juniors to play at. And I think that's the thing. I think we do need clubs in those vacuum areas. I mean, the North, I think Ahmed said made, made a really good point um, that in the North mm. at the moment, it is quite, quite, oh, what's the word? It, it's full. It, it's saturated, basically. And I, yeah, and, and I think yeah. in, in, um, in, in the Northern suburbs, we, we certainly don't need any more clubs. Um, all the clubs can grow. There are clubs at capacity. There's no doubt about that. Um, and this is the question, I guess, if, if, if we did get more facilities, would those clubs actually grow? Or Because or, or there, there are a lot of clubs in Geelong that are at capacity. In other words, they don't have the coaches, they don't have the volunteers, they don't have the um, financial support now to grow. And for them, 100, 150, 200 registered players is enough and they can't grow mm -hmm. anymore. There are other clubs that could that could, you know, we could easily have a couple of clubs in here that might be hitting six, seven hundred um, registered participants, no problem, if they had the fields, if they had the infrastructure. But I guess I, 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 I see both ways. I see the um, the reasoning where, yep, yeah, maybe we should um, have money being invested in infrastructure and all of that kind of stuff. And it's true. I think um, a tremendous amount of money over the last three to four years has been invested in improving um, the clubs. I think every single, or not every single one, but most of the northern suburbs clubs have got some sort of funding. Um, a lot of the southern clubs have as well. Um, but but there are areas of Geelong, as you so um, eloquently pointed out, um, Steve, um, you know, Highton, Warren Ponds, uh, Inner City, Newtown, there, mm. is, there are no clubs there. Um, you're going to tell mm. me that there is no room there for a junior club? Now, if someone like James or, or, or what you're not have uh, who have been involved in the past, there have been other academies as well that have done really well out of that whole area, Chilwell, Newtown, um, South Geelong area, Highton, um, simply because there's no clubs. And so these kids don't have anywhere to go. Or they have. They can go 10 minutes. But if you're living in Newtown, you're living in Highton, your, your eyes just went a little bit googly eyed there <laughs> we've got some lag we've had some it's funny we've had we've had someone from croatia no technological issues yeah. no time lags we have someone from um from geelong west turn hill and it's like this lag but uh speaking of uh technical issues i think we may have um james back on we'll bring james back on um kieran robinson's heightened hill fc oh i like that he's we, we, kieran robinson might be on to something we're gonna we're gonna try and bring um James Master Masterman back on, and hopefully we've got him back on. James, how are you? What happened there? Hello, hello, James, you're back. I, I I can't I can't hear. Can you hear us? No, no. Looks like we're we're having some sort of issues. With, um, James, unfortunately, look, mate. Um, we're gonna have to rock roll. Um rock and roll and call it a night we've already gone well over 90 minutes steve collar oh. makes another good point we will mention this because he has been yeah. creating another problem we should be trying to resolve the existing problems which is funding the existing infrastructure and maybe saving some funds to put towards a major hub for the region everyone's yeah. entitled to their opinion steve whether i agree or disagree with some of those points um some good points made there and um, i would love for this conversation to keep on um, um happening Let's keep this for next week because I think it's a good, good, good um, 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 topic of discussion. And, um, Steve, maybe we might even have another poll for next week, eh? We'll see if we can get a poll up for next week. Um, yeah, there's been some good conversation points tonight that we could create into framing a question. But I like um, Kieran's comment there, Heighton Hill FC. Maybe we could have a competition to name the future club in the region that doesn't yet exist. Yeah, I I, do, I I must admit I do I do like that um, name. It rings. So I'm kind of just um, what's the word? It just it's got this beautiful sort of um, um yeah. whatever you want to call it, I suppose. But a nice, just rings. It just goes beautifully, doesn't it? Yeah, it's got a nice ring to it. Yeah. 
Okay. And it's relevant to the topography of the suburb. Yeah. No. Look, I, th I think um, oh, this this is a conversation that we certainly need to to keep going. Um, but um, look, next week. Um, Monday night, 7 p.m. once again, um, uh, the Geelong Region Soccer Show. Until then, Thursday night, we've got a 7 p.m. show, the Football Out West Show. Now, this week, we've got a really, really important, um, um, uh, really important guest coming. Mm. That, You're that, talking mental health this week. Yeah, mental health. <clears throat> oh, what is that? Hello. <laughs> What is going on? All right, not to worry. Well, we're going to have to um, wind it up. We've gone well, well over time. And um, thank you to everyone who's been part of tonight's program. It has been very, very interesting. Um, it's been um, lots of um, lots of insight. And um, I look forward to next week, Steve. Me too, Tonchi. Already a lot to cover already that we couldn't fit in tonight. So it's going to be great. So, um, yeah, until I see your face next week, we'll uh, bid everyone good night. All right, there's, there's James, just as we've gone. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to finish here. We've gone well, well over time. Good night to everybody. Thank you very much for being a part of tonight's show. Really, really appreciate it. And um, good night for now.